The Paris Agreement is a ray of hope in a pretty bleak couple of decades for climate policy internationally. So this is the third of our lectures on focusing on climate policy. So we've looked at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. We've looked at the Kyoto Protocol briefly. And in this lecture, I want to go on to focus on the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. But I wasn't happy with uh, the last lecture with the Kyoto Protocol. And I want to just take a bit of time to make a stock take and review that and pick out some key points that I, I don't want it to lose us in the details. I really want to try and pull out the important things that I, I think it's useful for you to understand. If you ever are working in this area, you know, if you end up working for the a government and you're going to climate negotiations, you can immerse yourself in the detail. There's so much information on, you know, the different websites, the UNFCCC website. You can, you know, if you end up working in CDM, you know, you go home to China and you're working in some CDM sort of related mechanism, then, you know, you get, you'll get lost in the, the complex technical manuals. I don't want to do that for us. I just want you to be aware of the frameworks aware to find the detail so that you're equipped for the future. So I want to just recap on binding targets for Annex 1 countries, the flexibility mechanisms. I want to spend a little bit of time on carbon accounting because I started that yesterday and I sort of left it as, an, as a hanging thread where we started talking about the greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide equivalents. And I just want to give you an example of carbon accounting and how it works. Um, so to lock that down and then after that, I want to go on to the story of the negotiations from 2009 to uh, really to now. And big things in that is the Copenhagen disaster in 2009 and then the Paris Agreement in 2015. But along the way, I, I want to just pull out, tease out a couple of major issues. So red plus. So because of the disaster and the countries couldn't agree on binding targets, at the negotiations, they tried to focus on things that they actually could get agreement on. So everyone was happy to agree on some sort of mechanism to provide money to developing countries to not chop down forests and avoid land degradation. So Red Plus was a sort of, sort of like CDM, but different to CDM, but the same sort of some sort of funding mechanism. And so, and it was a sort of thing that they did at negotiations because they couldn't, get, you know, they, they couldn't get agreement on binding targets and the like. So I'll just mention Red Plus. Uh, glaring emissions is, in all of this, is there's you know, no credit for leaving fossil fuels in the ground, so that's just not part of the mechanisms. I'll just touch on that. And a really interesting initiative that Ecuador took in from 2009 to about 2012, 2014, where they proposed that they would leave, if, if the world paid them uh, some money or gave them yet you know, some financial assistance, they would leave this vast uh, body of um, oil in the ground in this Yusini, uh, Yusini ITT area. And uh, yeah, it was a bold initiative, but failed to really attract any real funding support. So ultimately Ecuador left it, uh, well, but is now proposing to develop that petroleum resource. So the, the lack of funding for countries to leave petroleum in the ground is a glaring omission. And that's the context for the Paris Agreement. I want to look at the big, you know, we've talked about the targets under the Paris Agreement. Let's have a, a re-look at them. Uh, I, and we'll talk about nationally determined contributions and the voluntary mechanisms. And then I'll We'll have a look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals and new treaties that have sort of been happening. So, you know, the other things haven't stopped. The UN Sustainable Development Goals are also a very important uh, international policy framework now. And then talk a little bit about the future and maintaining hope. And we'll go on then to a, afterwards to a workshop on yeah, building personal resilience, which in which maintaining hope is uh, crucial. Okay, so that's our plan. So let's start with a stock take of the Framework Convention and the Kyoto Protocol. And remember, we've already looked at the objective of the Framework Convention in Article 2 of avoiding dangerous climate change. It was qualitative. There was no number in it. So non 
qualitative, so by definition, no number, not quantitative. And so the two degree target came later and evolved uh, and now we've got it locked in in the Paris Agreement, a two degree and 1.5 degree. So uh, the whole, every country in the world is a party to the UNFCCC uh, and the Framework Convention in 1992 <laughs> divided between Annex 1 countries particularly they were the rich countries, as well as a mission, uh, uh, the countries left over from the breakup of the USSR, the economies in transition, and then the Annex II countries, which were essentially the rich countries minus the um, Russian Federation countries. So, and they were going to provide effectively money. And the um, uh, yeah, everyone else was a non-annex one um, party. So uh, that was the background. So we've got, I've given you this table already before, but um, Annex 1, Annex 2, non-Annex 1, uh, they're all terms that you hear a lot of and they're linked to the actual lists attached to that original convention with Annex 1 and Annex 2 being the, effectively the rich countries and everyone else is a non-Annex 1 country. And then uh, in the Kyoto Protocol, under Annex B to the Kyoto Protocol, there's a cross-reference back to uh, Annex 1 parties that have accepted binding commitments. So the big thing with the um, Kyoto Protocol was, so you know, there's a side story that I told you about how Al Gore really uh, pulled the... the Kyoto Protocol through when it, it didn't look like it would get there. It didn't look like the globe could agree on binding, you know, any binding targets. But then the Clinton administration, in which Al Gore was the vice president, failed to get any support. And when they put it before the Senate, it was comprehensively rejected. In fact, 95-0. So, um, yeah, just not even Democrats voting in favour of it. Absolutely no way it was getting through. So the US was never able to ratify the um, Kyoto Protocol because after the Clinton administration, you know that there was the Bush, the second Bush administration, and, there were, and Bush essentially took the Republican view that climate change is some uh, leftist Marxist plot to overthrow, you know, overthrow us and anti-capitalism and we choose not to believe it. So. Uh, the Bush administration, even before the September 11 attacks, the Bush administration was, was saying that they weren't going to take any action on climate change, that they weren't going to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. So there wasn't US leadership. <clears throat> and then, of course, there was the September 11 attacks in 2001, which completely um, then the US was consumed for the next five years. Uh, with you know the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you know that sucked all the oxygen out of uh, any you know push by you know within the U.S. But even before that, so what was happening then in that period from uh, 2000, 2000, 2001 when Bush was elected, uh, and the U.S. showed you know they were anti-taking any action on, on climate change and the um, global community um, in the lead up to the first commitment period under the Kyoto Protocol. So we know that the, in summary, this is the key things I want you to be aware of for the Kyoto Protocol just on this slide. So first, it created binding commitments for emissions reductions for Annex 1 countries during 2008 to 2012. So Australia, as I said, negotiated a sweetheart deal. It, it was basically a freeloader. Uh, we got a inc we got we set we got to include in our baseline um, vegetation emissions, and that massively bumped up our baseline. And then we also got uh, to ha be allowed an increase of 100 to, so that we committed to uh, limiting our emissions to 108% of our 1990 emissions. So we start really high and we get an increase. So Australia 
ultimately it was able to meet its commitments and you'll often hear the Australian government crow about, oh, we're one of the few countries to meet our Kyoto commitments and we've got a credit. So we actually have got to carry over credit still from basically that sweetheart deal that we rely upon and want to use to achieve our, our uh, emission reduction targets for the future. So it's a very dishonest, um, is dishonest the right word? Dishonest might not be the right word. It's an honest um, crookery. We're crooks. So we're honest crooks. Uh, and yeah, we've basically took, taken every opportunity to white hand the process. And I suppose if you are involved in international negotiations in the future, I hope you will be, but one of the key things is that we shouldn't be naive in thinking that all countries are there to actually solve the problem and work collaboratively to, you know, for the common good, that often typically they're there to protect their own interests, particularly the big and powerful countries. And uh, there's one country in particular that's famous for its um, uh, attempts to basically trip up the negotiations. Does anyone have a guess what that country is? It's not the, I'll tell you, it's not the US. Australia's quite infamous, often wins the, the conservation groups at the negotiations often have a, um, what do they call it, the fossil, the fossil award for the country that's done the most to impede negotiations progressing and Australia routinely wins that. But um, leave aside that it's not the US and it's not Australia. What country do you think might have a real interest in not, you know, no one taking any action on climate change? Uh, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia is famous or infamous for uh, in negotiations uh, going in and basically stalling and um, in negotiations when you're negotiating the text they have square brackets around text that isn't agreed and, and um, it's uh, Saudi Arabian negotiators are famous for going into meetings bracketing a whole heap of text and then leaving uh, so essentially just putting things into dispute and slowing up the negotiations. So why do you think they would, apart from the, the interest in basically their fossil fuel development, why, why do that? Why, why, why impede progress by other countries? If, at the end of the day, you can always veto. Effectively, you, if you don't vote in favour of it, because these agreements are working by unanimous agreement, why doesn't Saudi Arabia just at the end say, no, we don't agree? And, and block it at that point. Any thoughts? Absolutely right, yes. They don't want to be seen to be the only one that didn't vote in favour of a measure. So Saudi Arabia, you know, in the news, Saudi Arabia did this, but if you can do that, if you achieve the same effect in the back rooms where that doesn't get as reported, and it never gets to a vote, then you can effectively white, white hand. Does everyone, if I use the term white hand, does everyone, um, uh, so uh, white hand or termites, they're the things that eat like timber and so eat houses. So in Australia, you know, we're very conscious about white ants that get in and eat buildings and so we have termite protection. So if I use the term, they, you know, they white hand the negotiations they're like these little insects that get in and eat it up from the foundation so it all collapses. So there's a binding commitments under the Kyoto Protocol for 2008 to 2012. So as that first commitment period was approaching, the global community was trying to work out what it would do post-2012. So there was, you know, the commitments only went to 2012. So during 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, there was no possibility of the US giving any commitment because it was the Bush administration. And then what changed in 2008 in the US? The major change was Obama was elected. So, you know, the US presidents get two terms of four years. So Obama was elected in 2008. 
So when it came to the 2009 uh, negotiations, the world was really hopeful that the US would come forward and be uh, really positive. And uh, you know, I'll come to the what happened in 2009. Uh, but yeah, it ultimately all ended in tears. Um, Obama wasn't able to really deliver anything, and his focus in his first term wasn't on climate. His focus was on the whole healthcare issue in the US. So, uh, but effectively, the world was waiting through the Bush years, marking time, hoping that there would be better leadership in the US after Bush, because they knew that he had to go in 2008 and he couldn't be elected again. So, uh, there's a whole, so we can basically leave, leave over the, everything up until 2009 because we're pretty well waiting through the Bush years. So under the Kyoto Protocol, during those commitment periods, there were three flexibility mechanisms built in to try and allow the, particularly the binding commitments in Annex 1 to be met, but also to provide some funding to developing countries. So the joint implementation we talked briefly about yesterday, they were essentially... Um, collaborative measures between two Annex 1 countries. CDM is the one that was really popular because it was a measure whereby a, uh, credits could be generated in a developing country which a rich country could buy. So effectively rich countries were, were providing um, funding for uh, reductions in emissions from developing countries and those credits or the CDM credits were then able to be bought by Annex 1 countries and used to satisfy their targets. So even if they went over, you know, if they had a, they, you're a European country, you know, and you had to reduce your emissions by a certain amount, if you couldn't meet that, but you bought the gap from credits, you were taken to have met your commitment. So the clean development me mechanism was really popular generate a lot of projects. As I said yesterday, there's also a lot of issues around fraud. With it, the famous um, story of, you know, the companies in China generating uh, really potent greenhouse gases or, or, or manufacturing them and then claiming credits for destroying them. Uh, so, yeah, it was a very complex um, and technical... The, the manuals on it are really extensive. We don't need to get into those details. But yeah, it didn't include uh, really leaving fossil fuels in the ground, so you couldn't get any credit for that. Your sort of credits were for uh, installing, you know, being paid to, instead of installing, say, um, a generator, uh, burning fossil fuels, you know, using some sort of renewable energy or in some way reducing your emissions from associated with those sorts of activities or manufacturing. So. Uh, emissions trading was a bit of a blank slate in the um, Kyoto Protocol. There really wasn't any details about it. It was based upon uh, a mechanism that had been used in the US successfully for sulphur emissions around emissions from power stations and the idea that you could trade them so that you would essentially have allocate um, an amount of permits and then, com and then companies could buy and trade them and it effectively it would uh, be the most cost effective way it was said. Economists love the idea. Very complex uh, to, to do and there have been uh, the major emissions trading system that was developed was in Europe and it has been bedeviled by over allocations. So the um, countries then, the members of the EU were able to decide themselves how much they would allocate to their existing industries and they, over -alloc they all over allocated, or many of them, particularly the heavily polluting countries, over allocated um, essentially free permits to existing industries which then flooded the market and meant that the price signal sent by the emissions trading scheme was destroyed. So it's meant to send a price signal and it really it failed because of the politics around the allocation of permits. So in recent years, China has also developed an emissions trading scheme and sort of built it up from a small scheme and trying to make it bigger and bigger. Uh, I haven't seen any analysis of how well that's going. I suspect it's you know has the same problems uh, as 
yeah, as uh, Europe will have. It's really hard ultimately for the government to impose a price and stick to it. Uh, similarly, in Australia, we tried to have an, um, a price on carbon and, and permits and the like, and that was destroyed by, uh, it became very toxic politically, uh, and we were going to link it to Europe, uh, and through 2010 to 2012, we developed a whole price on carbon, and then at a federal election, uh, Tony Abbott uh, was the opposition leader, ran a really effective campaign uh, targeting the price on carbon, and uh, throughout the government and then got rid of our price on carbon. So Australia was the first country to both enact a carbon price and trading scheme and then also um, remove it. So emissions trading is, was a mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol uh, done at a national level. You know, there was ne there's never been an, an international trading scheme. Australia was trying to link to Europe but yeah, the biggest is really Europe. So there's a whole, I'm just going to emphasise, there's a whole range of other things that aren't in those three flexibility mechanisms that, we, that are widely used. So things like renewable energy targets, uh, fuel efficiency standards, um, efficiency standards for appliances. So if a government sets you know, a certain fuel efficiency for vehicles and continues to lower it, so that manufacturers are then encouraged to, to invest in improving uh, the efficiency of their vehicles, then you can effectively reduce your emissions from things like vehicles and appliances by making them, yeah, through those sorts of mechanisms. So lots of those mechanisms are in place globally. And as you, everyone knows, there's you know, been this big push for solar, wind. So a lot of things have been happening. Uh, with you know the, the Kyoto Protocol created a broad framework with some mechanisms, but there were some glaring emissions and yeah. I don't want to get, as I said, don't want to get bogged down in the Kyoto Protocol. I just emphasise so in Article One, see down the bottom, party included in Annex One means a party included in Annex One to the Convention. So there's that link to the UNFCCC and the Annex 1, list of Annex 1. So this is the list of Annex 1 countries in the UNFCCC. Uh, as I've said, Australia and pretty well all of Europe, um, the USA and, and yeah, New Zealand and you know, developed countries. So then when you look at something in the Kyoto Protocol in say Article 3, the binding targets were limited to Annex 1 countries and then that was linked to the gas as listed in Annex A and the commitment period of 2008 to 2012, which then came to be called the first commitment period and there was a second commitment period that got rolled over afterwards. So those were the greenhouse gases that were listed, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons and sulphur hexafluoride. Um, the f fourth and fifth of those are actually groups of gases. So there's lots of hydrofluorocarbons and lots of perfluorocarbons. So it's not just six gases in total. There's four individual gases and then two groups. So Annex B was, here's a, just a list from Annex B. So Australia, as I said, had 108% um, commitment. Sorry, its commitment was to limit its emissions uh, during 2008 to 2012 to 108% of its 1990 emissions. And, but most countries, uh, pretty well the whole of Europe, uh, committed to reducing their emissions. Now, it was obviously only going to be a first step. The Kyoto Protocol was never intended to actually solve climate change. You can see the, the actual reductions are quite small. You know, it, you're only looking, you know, at the biggest one is what an eight percent reduction over what you had, what you're doing in 1990. Of course, countries would say, well, in that period we're going to be growing. Our economy we expect to grow, so an eight percent reduction is actually really significant because otherwise we might be at 120. So if we're 92 percent instead of 120, we've actually, uh, you know, reduced a huge amount. But it never was the case that this would be anything more than a first step. So um, 
it's not really a, a surprise to see that you know there's been a lot of criticisms of the Kyoto Approach. This is just an article from Nature from 2012. The Kyoto Approach has, has failed, and that's a widely held view: the failure of the Kyoto Protocol. Um, article five, uh, though, I'll just say, and I agree. Uh, ultimately, the Kyoto Protocol just led to delay, uh, and it's failed. It really failed to you know, just look at the emissions globally. It, it hasn't, we haven't, if we've taken a few percent off it, that's still a failure. So uh, one aspect of the Kyoto Protocol that I just want to dwell on for a moment is carbon accounting. Uh, and it's a significant aspect of the whole regulatory regime because if you think about it, any future regulation is going to be based on some sort of accounting mechanism because if, basically if you can't count something, you can't regulate it. If you can't, say you want to, say in China that you're, you're giving out permits and, and allowing emissions trading and you have to be able to distinguish between one company that emits 10 tonnes of greenhouse gases and a country, a, sorry, a comp company right next door that emits 10,000 tonnes of greenhouse gases. So you have to be able to tell who is doing what to be able to then put a price signal or regulate them, any permits. And because once the gas is emitted into the atmosphere, you can't trace the individual source where it came from, and greenhouse gases are colourless and odourless so it's, you know, you can't wait until after they've emitted. You've got to have some mechanism that actually captures it, particularly the fuel as it's going through. So Article 5 provided that um, Annex 1 countries shall put in place a national system for the estimation of uh, emissions by sources and removals by sinks. And that leads on to carbon accounting. I just want to dwell on this for a moment. So there's a whole heap of work on the IPCC website about national greenhouse gas in inventories. And if you work in this area, uh, then yeah, it's really, I find it really interesting. Like I'm really interested in how you count greenhouse gases. And there's some really challenging topics like how you account for emissions from say, waste disposal uh, or industrial activities, it's yeah, a real challenge. Uh, there was quite an industry developing in Australia around this in 2012, and then when the uh, coalition government won and they killed the price on carbon, basically whole consultancies closed down, you know, hundreds of, or thousands of people that were basically gearing up to work in carbon accounting basically just got let go from a whole range of consultancies. So. It's still there though, because we still, in Australia, we've got a um, National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act. Uh, and I'll just um, touch on that just as an example. So yeah, as I've said, a critical part of any future regulatory response is how we account for greenhouse gases. So the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act, there's a really good website, you can just do a search for it. But essentially it reflects the international framework translated into a national framework. So we've taken the international rules that have been developed by the IPCC and we've translated into a national framework. So earlier in the year I was teaching uh, 26 uh, staff from the, Papua New Guinea, the government of Papua New Guinea <coughs> on climate law in Papua New Guinea and they don't have a uh, framework for accounting for greenhouse gases and so we were looking at how Australia does it and how that might be translated to for them. Uh, so Australia's approach, as I said, reflects the international framework. So we've got the six greenhouse gases, as they're called, but as I said, there's two um, groups of gases. So carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, sulfur hexafluoride. Um, just thinking about that, what's the defining, is there anything consistent with um, so we know that the major gases in the atmosphere, like every time we breathe in, we're breathing in mo mostly nitrogen. Yep, nitrogen and oxygen. So that's N2 and O2. Okay, so two atoms 
uh, in the molecule. Now notice carbon dioxide is three, so carbon and two oxygens. Methane is five, carbon four hydrogens. Nitrous oxide is three, so two nitrogens and oxygen. And sulfur hexafluoride, sulfur hexafluoride has got seven atoms. And as a rough rule of thumb, any molecule with three atoms or more is going to be a greenhouse gas. Because what's happening with a greenhouse, ga greenhouse gases is as infrared radiation is moving back out into space, effectively they collide with uh, a molecule. And if, I'm, if you imagine just I'm a carbon dioxide with a uh, carbon in the middle and two oxygens, effectively it's large enough, that the, large enough to interact and the, it causes the whole molecule to shake. So there's energy absorbed and it interacts with the infrared radiation and then it re-emits it. And it might re-emit it up, but it also might re-emit it backwards. So it's basically all this series of collisions with uh, the greenhouse gases and uh, the two main gases, nitrogen and oxygen, basically just don't interact at all with the uh, infrared radiation. So they're not greenhouse gases. Uh, water vapor, H2O, is three atoms. So that's your basic rule of thumb for a greenhouse gas. And yeah, there's some really potent greenhouse gases in the hydrofluorocarbons and perfluorocarbons. Uh, and as yeah, we were talking about global warming potentials yesterday, so the reference unit is carbon dioxide is one, but then something like sulfur hexafluoride is 23,000 times more powerful than one molecule of carbon dioxide. So visualising that is really hard. So what is a tonne of a gas? Uh, so at standard temperature and pressure, one tonne of CO2 would basically be that big, eight metres, um, eight metre cube. So we might have in this room, do you think we'd fit two or three of those? So if this room was purely carbon dioxide, then A, we'd all be dead, um, but B, it would only, there'd only be about three tonnes. And so the globe is emitting gigatons, so billions of tons of carbon dioxide, like or humans are emitting billions of tons. It's it's actually really hard to conceptualize how massive that is when but you know in, in this room we might fit three tons of carbon dioxide. And yeah, this is another attempt to try and visualize what a ton of carbon dioxide would actually look like or the space that it would occupy at standard temperature and pressure. Um, so that's part, part of the, uh, the difficulty of accounting is it's so hard to actually think of you know, what it is that you're counting. One of the big things that's been used internationally uh, was developed for business accounting and has been adopted um, in national frameworks. So we use what are called scopes of emissions. I've mentioned these in an earlier lecture. So the scopes of emissions are um, Scope one is direct emissions from an activity. So when you get in your car and you turn on the engine, and if it's not electric, you know, you're burning uh, a fossil fuel, and out of your exhaust is coming to carbon dioxide. So driving uh, your car, you've got scope one emissions. So similarly, if you are a, say, a coal mine, and you've got big trucks going around, you know, burning diesel, there's scope one emissions from that activity. Uh, or, you know, if you're a company that, you know, is a freight company, then your scope one emissions are from your vehicle fleet. Scope two emissions are emissions from electricity that occur off-site. So in this room, we've got we're generating electricity. Sorry, we're not generating electricity. We're using electricity. So there would be some scope two emissions associated with our activity now. So if we were trying to account for the emiss emissions associated with our course, we could look at you know, what were the emissions associated with our use of electricity. Even though we're not burning a fossil fuel in this room, a fossil fuel is being burnt to, uh, you know, to run the lights. Having said that, as you know, UQ has a massive solar array so, uh, and, and almost generates enough um, on, a, you know, on a day like today to power itself during the day, so probably a, a fair bit of our electricity here is coming from solar. So if you're looking at scope two emissions, you look at, typically you look at the average sort of um, uh, emissions in, in a network. Um, 
rather than you know, like an individual source like here where we're probably getting it from solar. Okay, and then scope three emissions are another way of accounting for emissions that aren't, from, aren't directly associated with an activity or aren't generated directly from an activity, aren't about electricity, but, in, but you still want to account for them for whatever reason. So uh, the classic one that um, companies often account for in terms of their scope three emissions is air travel by their employees. So if you're a company and you send someone to a conference in Sydney and they jump on a plane and fly down, then there's emissions associated with them getting there, which you haven't generated because, you know, whatever airline you flew on, they were the ones that were burning the fuel, but you made use of that. So you can account for that sort of travel as scope three emissions, or like taxi travel by your employees is often accounted for as scope three emissions. Uh, it's really significant for some activities like fossil fuels. So a coal mine has scope one and scope two emissions, but the scope three emissions are about 98% of the total emissions. So there's a big fight in when we assess coal mines in Australia, there's been a big fight over whether you should even assess the burning of the fuel in Japan or China. And the point we've always made in arguments about that is, well, the atmosphere doesn't notice any difference whether it's burned in China or Japan, it still impacts us here in Australia. Yep? Um, isn't the, is the issue with the scope three that it's already been like accounted for somewhere else? Good question. Uh, yes and no. Uh, it depends, like if you're, uh, if for instance you're trying to do an environmental impact assessment of a coal mine. so. Climate change is like the elephant in the room. Like this is a massive big fossil fuel, like so the Adani mine, massive big amount of coal. So climate change and the emissions from burning the coal, if you don't look at it at that stage and it, you let it be dug up and it goes and burns, uh, is burnt in Japan or China or India, then it's going to impact on the environment and impact back here in Australia. If you don't look at that in terms of the environmental impact, you're really ignoring a significant environmental issue. And environmental impact is, is, is about informing a decision maker about the true environmental impacts. So if you're assessing for like for a project by project, uh, it's, there are emissions associated with the burning of the fuel. So if you don't assess it there, then it's just not part of the, you know, the assessment. And, and you might be approving something that only makes sense in the context of, you know, what's intended to be done with the product. So uh, typically you, you need to look at in environmental impact assessment both the direct and indirect impacts. That's, I was involved in a court case a decade ago about a big dam and it was the dam, was called the Nathan Dam in Queensland and just, just as an example of a different like environmental impact assessment with direct and indirect, okay, so this dam was Um, I was just going to show you a picture of it, so it's on my website. So the proposal for this dam, the dam actually hasn't been built yet, but it was proposed to be built, do I have a map? No. So this dam was proposed to be built in um, central Queensland uh, on the Fitzroy, was it the Dawson River flowing into the Fitzroy? and. The dam was to be built, and it talked about this in, in the proposal for the dam, it was to supply water for downstream agricultural users. Uh, and uh, so the dam was being built to supply water, and there was a real concern that the downstream farmers would use, it was particularly for cotton, and there was concerns that essentially the spraying of the cotton would result in pollution flowing out to the Great Barrier Reef.
So I acted for two conservation groups, particularly the Worldwide Fund for Nature, who um, raised concerns about the pollution of the reef from farmers using water from the dam. And the Federal Environment Minister said, those are not impacts of the dam, that those are impacts of third parties. We challenged that and said the minister took too view, narrow a view of impacts. And the uh, federal court agreed and said that's too narrow, uh, that impacts include both the direct and indirect effects. So if you're building a dam for the purpose of supplying water, and then there may be pollution from the use of people using that water, then you can consider, and that, that the farmers can't go ahead without the dam, then you can consider the indirect impacts as in the, and you should consider them as part of the assessment of the dam. So if you think about that in the context of climate change, the impacts of, you know, if you're supplying, digging up um, coal, you can consider the burning of the coal by someone else as an indirect impact of the, um, of the coal mine. So we've always had that argument about direct and indirect. The scope one, two, and three is just the accounting framework that's used. Scope three emissions are effectively indirect emissions. Yep. Just from like an accounting perspective, how would you avoid double counting? So if we say, okay, Australia's got to capture their scope yep. three emissions. Great. Would you like erode confidence in the numbers on an international scale? Great question. So basically, at a international level, countries only account for their scope one emissions. So Australia, for instance, only reports its scope one emissions. And that's great for us because we're a fossil fuel exporter. The coal that we export, and we're the, you know, now the, what, the biggest uh, gas exporter as well, none of that shows up in our books. So Australia reports that it, its total annual emissions are about 550 million tonnes. Our coal and gas are that again or more, I haven't seen, I've seen a few reports lately, but you know, it's, it's, it's actually more than, more than our direct emissions, we actually export more, and which is burned in other countries. But if we export coal to Japan, and it's burned in Japan, then it shows up on Japan's books. So there's no double counting in that way, uh, but it means that a country like Australia can claim, not our problem, you know, if we have the Adani mine or we, you know, that it, we're not responsible for that under the international system. So there's been criticisms of that and saying we should look at the supply, not just the use. Um, certainly for environmental impact assessment under Australian legislation, we have to consider the downstream emissions, but at international level, you only report your scope one emissions. So that's great, for, say, for Saudi Arabia and Australia. Uh, it's not going to be. Yeah, it's just there's just no push for that globally, really. Um, so when we then look at, so, so under say the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act, you only report scope one and two emissions. There's no reporting of scope three. So, so can I just give you one brief case study? And I'll just use some numbers for this. But there used to be a, well, there is still a power station at Swan Bank. I used to take when I used to teach the first semester course, the environmental regulatory frameworks, and we would do a bit on climate change. I took, used to run field trips with them out to Swanbank. So it's about 30 kilometres southwest of here. And just focusing in on Swanbank, coming down, this is looking across a, a lake uh, in the distance, or, or the thing you can see on the other side is the old um, Swanbank B, the um, coal-fired power generator. That closed down a few years ago, basically because the company wasn't making enough money. Um, but um, when it was running, you know, you'd go there. They're really interesting. If you ever get a chance to go to a power station, they're really interesting how big they are and noisy. And yep, so that's the Swanbank B. And then it also had um, Swanbank E, which was a gas-fired power station. Uh, and these little things in the, uh, are the cooling towers. So there's no big, you know, that big classic dome things. They were much smaller here. So there's gas and coal. And anyway, to calculate the emissions, you could look at the, a simple um, rule of thumb is to use the National Greenhouse um, Factors Workbook. 
So, and, and for a power station like this, the, the, the key thing is if you can work out the emissions if you know the amount of fuel that you've burnt. Um, and if you've got that, then, which, which all companies know, like, you know, like if you're a trucking company, then you know how much fuel you've burnt because you've paid for it all. It's part of, you know, your core accounts. Similarly for a coal-fired power generator, you know how much fuel you've burnt because you had to buy it all. You had to pay for it all. So you've already got those records. So what this allows you to do is um, multiply the quantity of fuel, which is Q, so um, the EIJ on the left is the emissions, and you can emissions equal the quantity multiplied by what's called the energy content factor and the emissions factor, and then divided by a thousand just for the figures, just to get the right units. So uh, in these sorts of systems, there's, you can basically just look at a table to get um, the figures. So for anthracite, so black coal, the EC is 29, and then the EF, you're supposed to, if you do it properly, multiply um, for carbon dioxide, uh, methane and nitrous oxide, but notice how there's virtually no um, carbon dioxide, sorry, methane or nitrous oxide. The, the factors are so small, so 88.2 for carbon dioxide, 0.03 for methane, 0.2 for nitrous oxide. So what I'm going to do is cheat a little bit. To do it properly mathematically, you're supposed to do them individually and then add them together, but I'm just going to say 88.43 is what we're going to multiply by. So the sort of amount that the coal-fired power generator used to use was something like uh, 813,162 tonnes of coal per year. Multiply that by 29, the EC, then by the EF of 88, divide by 1,000, that gets you 2 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents. So that's the most simple form of carbon accounting. So if you've got a liquid fuel or a solid fuel, you can basically work out the amount of emissions from knowing the amount of fuel that's consumed. It gets a lot more complicated with things that aren't just burning a fuel. So there's emissions from, say, waste disposal. So if you've got a rubbish dump, working out what are the emissions coming out of a, the decomposition of a rubbish dump can be is really complex. Um, so if you get into those frameworks, they are really complex, but we don't need to um, get caught in the complexity. I just want you to understand that you can work out the amount of emissions, particularly for, say, burning a fuel, and that allows you to calculate yeah, how much has been emitted. So if you know the amount of fuel that's been used around Australia, then you, that's you know, how we work out our national accounts. And similarly in China, how it works out, or in the US or Europe, how they work out the total of their emissions is they add up effectively all the fuel that they think are being you know, used, and then uh, you look at other activities like waste um, and the like, and then that all taken together are your national emissions. So that's the essence of carbon accounting. Anyone got any questions on that? Don't want to, not important for you know the exam, I'm not going to ask you questions about carbon accounting other than you know on previous exams I've, I've asked you know a basic question like explain what carbon dioxide equivalents are and why they're you know how they're used in regulating greenhouse gases and you could the answer to that would be there are carbon dioxide equivalents are a unit that's used to group all greenhouse gases together and they're you know the main unit that's used for carbon accounting and reporting under the Kyoto protocol the UNFCCC and the like so I'd just like you to be aware of that term but beyond that the technicalities are not important for us um, okay so Yes. Yes. Oh. 
That is a great question, uh, and it depends on the country they're in. So if you're a company that has to report under the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act, then, uh, <laughs> then you would follow the framework there. But if you're a company that, say you're an international company that you're an airline or something like that, and you're flying in multiple different jurisdictions and some don't require you to report, a lot of companies now undertake voluntary reporting. So you will see a uh, greenhouse report, or it might be part of their overall sustainability reporting, and they use the same framework of scope one, two, and three. There's the, uh, there's an international, what are they called, the World Business Council or whatever, that developed the original standards. So there's a, essentially in international standards for business accounting for greenhouse emissions from corporations. And those are widely used and they're done voluntarily by, particularly by yeah, large airlines or the like. A lot of big multinationals now report their emissions and they typically include scope one, two and three. Um, but the, particularly the scope three emissions are seen as a voluntary component. There's rarely a requirement to report scope three. Although when we had a price in carbon uh, here in Australia for a brief time, we actually did have a scope three component liability, which was um, there was, when we had a price on carbon, there was the scope one emissions um, liability for if you emitted over, uh, I think it was 25,000 tonnes of um, CO2, or well, that's the threshold for the National Greenhouse and Reporting Act. But there was also uh, an emissions, uh, y the gas corporations were liable for um, the gas that they sold and were consumed by individual consumers. And if you think about it, um, uh, if you sell gas, like, and does anyone here have gas at home? So when you burn the gas at home to cook or you know, you're having a shower and there's gas burning, that's a scope one emission for your household. For the company that supplied you with the gas, that is a scope three emission because they're, it's not actually their, they're not actually making the emission. It's not part of their activity. They supplied you with the gas and you burnt it. But under the emissions, um, uh, the pricing mechanism we had in Australia, they had to pay the price for those emissions. And the obvious reason for that was because they didn't want to have, you know, 500,000 households having to report and pay for their individual emissions. And with a big gas network, it's pretty clear that a, ba a big gas company, um, you know, they supply it on bulk. And then if you make them liable for it, then they just pass on the price to consumers. But it then becomes very, you know, you can see how it's becoming like a tax. And that's what it was attacked as, a carbon tax it was called even though there was an element of emissions trading in it, it was attacked as just a tax. And it became politically toxic to the point where in Australia there's just no way we're going to have a carbon price any, for any foreseeable, any time in the foreseeable future. Cool. Okay, so um, there are yeah, significant gaps in the Kyoto Protocol. The elephant in the room is mining and energy policies. In Australia, our national and state governments are all basically have a policy that we're going to dig up and burn all of our fossil fuels. So it's not just the Adani mine. Everything basically that someone wants to dig out of the ground, we are going to let them. And we're not going to take, you know, we don't want the burning or impact on climate change to be taken into account. That's pretty well government policy. So in New South Wales at the moment, where earlier in the year a court rejected a coal mine in part due to its scope three emissions, the New South Wales government is in the process of enacting new laws that will um, prohibit scope three emissions being taken into account when assessing New South Wales coal mines. So, um, yeah, so we've got a lot of uh, oil and gas. And yeah, this is like a graph from a coal consumption and production to 2035 projected by the Australian government in its energy white paper in 2011 and you can just see their production increasing up to 2035 and beyond. Our plan is to dig up and burn everything. So I liken it to believing in the tooth fairy because that's pretty well what we're basing our climate policies on, the, the thought that we can have this and it actually won't cause impacts or we can meet our 
our, the, you know, the Paris goals even, and still burn all, of, all our fossil fuels is just mutually inconsistent. I want to move on from the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, there were gaps. There were three main flexibility mechanisms. There were the binding targets, but it failed. Bottom line was it failed. And I want to look at the UNFCCC negotiations for what came, what would come after it, and want to look really from 2009 onwards. But it's uh, we've been going for an hour. Why don't we take a 10-minute break? So uh, turn the lights back on, pop up. Uh, go and grab a coffee, come back and we'll look at the negotiations up to the Paris Agreement. Action. So the Kyoto Protocol was only ever intended as a first step. In the lead up to the first commitment period, <coughs> there was a big focus on what, what will come after it. So the commitment period was from 2008 to 2012, or the first commitment period was. As I mentioned earlier, the hostility of the Bush administration in the US to any action on climate change, its refusal to ratify the Kyoto Protocol really inhibited progress. So the global community effectively waited, particularly, I'm going to say global community, I'm particularly talking about Europe, so waited for a new president. So with fingers crossed that it would be someone better than the Bush administration. So when Barack Obama was elected in 2008, it was, you know, euphoria. Of course, this is occurring also in the context of the 2007-2008 global financial crisis, which in part was was precipitated by Bush's the Bush administration and their deregulation of the financial sector and lack of oversight. So, when Obama came to power in 2008, he was dealing with uh, an economy in crisis. Uh, his focus in his first term was on uh, improving healthcare, well, stabilising the economy. Say that was his first priority, but uh, enacting much better healthcare laws in the U.S. was his was his other big uh, domestic policy agenda. So, climate change didn't become uh, a really important component of his agenda until his second term. But there was still euphoria, and there was the hope that there would be something better from the U.S. And certainly they sounded better, but in the lead up to then the uh, conference of the party in 2009, which was held in Copenhagen, it was COP15, CMP5, the negotiations, uh, you know, there's, there's just such hope that the, the global community could come together and agree on something better to solve this uh, crisis. And in the context of these negotiations, so we're going to follow the, the trail through for the last, really from 2009 till now, and look at the Paris Agreement. But I just wanted to mention again the importance of voting blocks. So the G77 and China is the developing country voting bloc and very, very important in international meetings. So originally founded in 1964, with 70, presumably with 77 members. So it was called the Group of 77, now has over 130 members, plus China. So obviously you notice how the phrasing of that, uh, China's not wanting to be, you know, it's the group of developing countries, so it's the G77 plus China. Uh, so China um, yeah, obviously gets a, has very important status within it. Uh, within the G77, actually, you know, I've, I said before, I've put these as like subgroups, but they're not a subgroup per se of the G77 that's not structured that way. But the Africa group is the group of all African countries. They are all also members of the G77. And the Alliance of Small Island States is a group of, or coalition of 43 low-lying and small island countries, such as the Maldives and Tuvalu. 
that are particularly impacted by climate change and they have been very strong in advocating for stricter or stronger targets. So AOSIS is a very important um, voting block and, and group. And then the LDCs, the, the 50 poorest countries in the world, and they get special status and special financial assistance. Yes? Uh, just to check, so when you say a voting block, would the African group, would they always uh, vote with the G77, or would these smaller sub-blocks vote on separately? I think like all of these things, it's more complicated than there's uh, no doubt there is a lot of, uh, there are many countries that will routinely vote together and share resources because they, you know, they, they have common interests. Uh, at the same time, it doesn't, you know, they're not strictly binding so that you have to vote. Uh, the EU is probably the, the strongest in terms of the legal framework for voting. So the EU uh, typically, you know, adopts a single position and then all of their 40, how many, countries in the EU, 27, all of their 27 votes basically go as a block and they, they're also recognised typically as a single, get, they get a single vote for the EU as well. So that would probably be the, the strongest in terms of the cohesion of the voting blocks. But uh, the main thing I wanted to emphasise is there are these groups and they share resources so that if you go to, you know, if you go to negotiations and particularly if you're a small country with only one representative there and you can't attend all of the meetings, then being part of a voting bloc allows your interest to still be represented at different meetings, even though you don't have the resources to attend all of the side meetings. So um, Africa Group, Al Alliance of Small Island States, LDCs, they're not structured as subgroups of the G77, but all of the countries in those groups are also part of the uh, G77, and, and obviously there'd be a number of overlaps between LDC and the Africa group, group as well. Then there's the European Union. There's a couple of other weird ones. The Umbrella Group, a loose coalition of non-EU developed countries. Um, yeah, Australia, Canada, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, and the Russia Federation, Ukraine, and the USA. And the Environment Integrity Group and the like. So uh, I just mentioned those. Be aware of the G77 in China. It's a significant... Uh, part of the whole UN system and uh, many international treaties. Yeah, currently 134 members. And that's a map showing the G77 in China locations. So during these meetings, uh, there's often many side meetings. And in between the COPs, for big complicated treaties like this, there will often be uh, intermediate sort of meetings. So this is the 14th session of the ad hoc working group on further commitments for Annex 1 parties under the Kyoto Protocol, the acronym being AWG-KP, and the 12th session of the ad hoc working group on long-term cooperative action under the convention, the acronym being AWG-LCA, uh, which took place in October 2010 in China. So. Um, that's in the lead up to uh, one of the um, big COPs. So, yeah, so there were preparatory talks for the 16th COP in Cancun in November, December. So there's meetings that will be occurring, you know, through the year, and then there's a big meeting at the end. So, yeah, there's another picture from that same uh, meeting in China. So I don't need to to go into this article. Um, George Monburn, if anyone reads him, he's a UK writer, uh, very cutting, uh, interesting, very interesting thinker. You get really his point from the title of this article. So this was written after 2010. So the 2009 negotiations in, Ken in Copenhagen, there was so much uh, hope that there would be some big agreement reached and it turned into a disaster. It, it was administratively a disaster. Um, there was, for instance, it was, Ken it was winter in Copenhagen and the administration by the Danish government really fell apart and there were these massive um, convention centres with uh, huge security. So this is 2009, you know, there are all sorts of terrorist threats. 
And so there were all these security for people getting into the, you know, to any sessions. And there were stories about people waiting for hours outside in the snow, waiting to get through security. So it all just turned into an administrative, but very much a political failure. And there was a lot of acrimony after it, particularly between the US and China, both blaming each other for the failure. And yeah, Monbiot wrote, climate change enlightenment was fun while it lasted, but now it's dead. And yeah, this is, again, you get enough from the, the title. I don't need to click on the story, but just an article from 2000, October 2010, China and the US blame each other in climate standoff. So this is you know, the following year and the lead up to the next round of, or the next COP. But yeah, it was a terrible, terrible disaster. And then uh, lots of stories, I just keep building them up, uh, you know, moving through time. So 2012, uh, China, this story here about um, China's chief climate negotiator, Su Wei, who, uh, yeah, w they were very wary about taking on any binding commitments. So remember, the Annex 1 countries had binding commitments. China wasn't an Annex 1 country, so it had no binding commitments. And that was one of the major reasons why US people who were opposed to uh, the US taking action, they would say, well, we're taking on commitments, but China isn't taking on commitments, therefore, you know, it's unfair to us. And there's not, also, you know, obviously China, there's a lot of answers to that. China's is still a relatively poor country developing. The US has got this hysteri historic legacy of, you know, decades of massive emissions. China's only just beginning, you know, if you look at the cumulative amount of emissions, the US has got this huge legacy, plus you're rich. So there's a lot of answers to that, but it was still a total block on Australia um, through this period. No, no, this is um, 2012, so Australia had moved on, but Australia refused to sign the Kyoto Protocol for uh, siding with Bush, and it was the US and Australia were the two standouts refusing to sign the Kyoto Protocol until Kevin Rudd was elected in 2008, and then one of his first acts was to go to Bali and uh, deposit the instrument of ratification for the Kyoto Protocol and you got a standing ovation for that and it you know it was this moment of light in Australian politics where after having lived through the Howard years where they were trying to delay any action on climate change in 2008 it seemed like maybe we could actually succeed uh, so that was the context uh, China very wary of taking on any commitments and then there's a series then of um, annual meetings, so and they move around the world. So the next one was in Cancun in Mexico, COP16 and CMP6. And again, just a screenshot of a um, one of the side meetings, the third part of the, th of the 16th session of the ad hoc working group on further commitments for Annex 1 parties to the Kyoto Protocol and also that other group. So this is in 2011 in Panama City. So lots of meetings going on around the world. Then Durban, South Africa in 2011, so COP17 and CMP7. And you, you see sort of, they often like to uh, link the name of the city to where it was held to the name of the an agreement. So there's a Kyoto Protocol in 1997, signed in Kyoto. Then uh, this is just a diagram you know, talking about the Cancun agreements. So this was what was agreed in Cancun in Mexico. And then the Durban platform, the 2011, this is what came out of the South African meeting. So, uh, and th this idea of it's a bridge. So a nice metaphor. And you can see there just a summary. So in the Cancun, so key features of the Kyoto Protocol, clean development mechanism, joint implementation, emissions trading, uh, targets binding only for developed countries, 5.2% um, below 1990 levels by 2012. Um, Cancun agreements, non-binding but aims to keep world at two degrees. Um, green climate fund, uh, clean technology centre, measurement, reporting and verification features. Um, the Durban platform, um, targets to be decided also Key features also to be decided, but it triggers a process to close the gap between Cancun targets and two degrees target. 
Um, this is an article from 2011 saying, you know, um, Obama's envoy for climate change cast out on Kyoto Protocol, said the European Union was the only remaining major player that would potentially support a continuation of the Kyoto Protocol after its provisions expire in 2012. So um, Doha in uh, Qatar in uh, 2012, COP18, CMP9, so this is the end of the first commitment period and still no real replacement in sight. A, we did have a second commitment period come in place, but essentially there's a lot of lack, there's a lack of progress in, in any new targets and how we're going to achieve stabilization. So I just wanted to mention Red Plus in that context. So one of the things that was happening at a lot of these meetings was uh, they're try, you try and work on the, th if you can't agree on certain issues, then work on things you can agree on. And everyone could support protecting tropical forests better. So RED and RED plus was uh, so reducing, RED stands for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation or land degradation in developing countries. And you can find out a large amount of information uh, on the RED plus website. And the, the plus stands for also uh, having biodiversity benefits. And essentially it was something that they could agree on. It was, a, it was similar to this clean development mechanism, essentially some sort of funding channel to get money to developing countries to protect forests or to manage them better. So positive, uh, but um, also there have been a number of criticisms of it. So there's a really interesting professor here, a nice professor, um, Kristen Lyons. She works in... Um, sort of social, uh, what, faculty school of social science, yeah, at UQ, lovely um, professor, and does a lot of work in developing countries. And this research was about work she'd done in Uganda, and how essentially there's a Norwegian um, company basically paying, buying credits or Red Plus credits through plantations in Uganda, but the social impacts on that of that were that people were pretty well pushed off their land for the plantation to go in. So it might sound positive, but then the actual implementation in countries can be very disruptive for the societies. So um, the abstract says, private sector investment has become increasingly central to development in the global south. And in recent years, these interventions have taken a green turn uh, investment me mechanisms and they're exploring the activities of Green Resources, the largest plantation forestry operator in the African continent. Through its ex examination of its activities in Uganda, this paper argues that while the private sector international investment on plantation forestry for carbon offsetting is widely supported, uh, it's, it is part of carbon colonialism and neoliberal land grab. The, there are profound adverse local livelihood outcomes that arise on the basis of this carbon colonial carbon colonial carbon colonialism so i don't want to d delve into the detail of that but red plus is is a mechanism to be aware of uh, and with all of these things they're complex the actual administration of them and avoiding sort of perverse outcomes unintended outcomes unintended consequences is actually really hard and there's it, it's also hard to with these sorts of things, you know, if you're going to give a credit, it also requires ongoing monitoring. So if you've given a credit for a forest that's been established and then, you know, after you've paid the money, the forest gets chopped down, then, you know, it, the ongoing monitoring of activities or, you know, you, you give a credit for a forest that's been planted um, or land degradation that's been, you know, avoided and then after five years that plantation has died. So, you know, what was thought to, was going to generate all of these carbon offsets, if it hasn't in fact achieved that, then, you know, they're fake credits. So there's a lot of difficulties with all of these systems and they're complex. So yeah, and the big glaring gap in all of this continues to be the lack of any credit for leaving fossil fuels in the ground. It's a major emission from the negotiations and I just wanted to play you a little clip uh, about the Yusini ITT project. So this is a great, was a great idea, a great proposal by Ecuador, uh, but 
it hasn't um, been successful. Of the Yasuni ITT initiative projects. 
Who is supporting the Yasuni ITT project? The Yasuni ITT fund will receive donations from different sources, contributions of countries from all over the world and international cooperation, responsible corporations concerned with the future of mankind, philanthropists worried about the possible consequences of climate change, small donors and global citizens who would access our website. History. The petroleum stays there, underground, forever. Covered by this unique biodiversity, protected by the Tagaeri and Tarumenane, by their ancestral rights. So that documentary was actually from 2009. Yusuni National Park was in, is in the east of Ecuador. And in January 2012, the Ecuador government announced that it would go ahead with the Yusuni ITT initiative. Um, but by August the next year, 2013, it was closed because essentially hardly re received any donations. It was only able to secure 11 million in donations after almost four years of international negotiations. So uh, Ecuador is proposing this, no real interest from the international community in taking them up on this. So if you think about it from, say, a developing country's perspective, you know, you've got a lot of poverty, people living in poverty, uh, and you're faced with the choice, you know, if you're Ecuador or Nigeria or, you know, a country that has a lot of oil or gas, uh, or coal, do you develop those resources or do you leave them in the ground? If you leave them in the ground, no one is actually going to give you credit for that. You don't get credit under CDM. You don't get credit even under, you know, I suppose you could claim it under the Paris Agreement as part of your um, nationally determined contribution, but it would be, my view, it would be unusual because basically no one is, no one thinks in those terms. We only think in our actual emissions. We, you don't get credit for leaving something in the ground, and it's just such a obvious, glaring deficiency. So um, there was a vote which Ecuador rejected uh, about basically stopping. You know, the lo the indigenous people didn't want any drilling in the area, and uh, yeah, it was rejected by the. This is from 2014, rejected by the Ecuador government. So. Obviously, people have written that up, um, see it as being, you know, a, a great initiative if it could get up, but it's just not supported internationally. So, and it, it's similar in ways to CDM and Red Plus, but neither of those established and recognised international frameworks will actually give a country credit for leaving resources in the ground. You can get funding for, you know, planting trees that were cut down, or, or not cutting, you know, potentially not cutting down trees, but leaving the Oil in the ground, nothing. Okay, so that's just, yeah, you got a question? How, how would you avoid like, some of the same calamities associated with Red Plus in terms of like, controlling for leakage or distributing benefits equitably? Like, wouldn't it, it's an awesome concept, obviously, but wouldn't How would you avoid the sort of Red Plus consequences? I don't think there's any simple answer to that. Uh, as I see it, one of the, you know, huge positives of the Yusini ITT initiative was, was that it was proposed by Ecuador. So it was the country itself. It wasn't, you know, the EU going in and saying, we will do this, uh, we'll give you this funding. Uh, it was 
so it was coming from the country itself. Uh, it still could have led to social problems on the ground, but uh, yeah, I don't think there's no simple answer. I mean, Red Plus on the face of it sounds like a positive thing, but then Kirsten's um, work shows that you know what looks good on the surface. You actually have to monitor and evaluate on the ground to see whether it's whether there are unintended consequences that are negative. So, yeah. Other questions? Did you have a question? No. Okay. So moving on. So this, these thing, these sorts of wheels are spinning. You know, at different times through this period. Um, Warsaw, uh, Poland, 2013, COP19, CMP9. Um, Poland often is, again, one of the uh, laggard states because it's got a lot of um, fossil fuel uh, generation, so it, it's often seen as a laggard. It, it, um, you know, I think that was one of the COPs where you know, the host had sort of presentations from the fossil fuel sector and uh, it's, yeah, it sort of hosts it, but it doesn't really support um, the framework. Uh, here's Bonn uh, in uh, October 2014, so another major conference. Now, the thing that had changed at this point was that uh, it's a Obama's second term and he was working with China. So in the lead up to, so we know that there's a Paris Agreement in 2015, but the hint that, that, was, that there was something positive happening really started to emerge in about 2013-2014 with uh, the US trying to work with China to and they stopped being acrimonious and they started trying to work together so there was a, and there was a bilateral agreement between China and the US in relation to climate which was a really positive uh, initiative it was in, a, in around 2014-2015 in the lead up to the uh, Paris meeting at the end of 2015. So this is what's happening in this. The winds really changed and it was their leadership, China and the US, that really ultimately resulted in a really different outcome in Paris. Plus, you know, the French government was really good. They were, they were really strong in their administration and sort of husbanding through the agreement. But without Obama and without the, without China taking a leadership role, it wouldn't have happened. And it, yeah, it took a big build up to it. Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, was also instrumental and showed great leadership, held a number of high level meetings trying to build momentum. And we were going from a situation where, you know, after 2009, it was dead, it was flat, the wheels were just spinning, but there was no direction to the negotiations. They weren't really going anywhere. And then 2013, it started to change. 2014 and 2015, it picked up momentum. And in that context, Lima, Peru in 2014, things were actually starting to move forward now. And there was a high level, um, UN high level climate summit in New York in September 2014, again, the, this is uh, Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, and Obama trying to build momentum. And yeah, I'll summarise it there in the heading, that the political leadership from Ban Ki-moon, President Obama and China laid the foundation for the success in Paris in the coming year. But it took a lot of work and yeah. So Paris, the COP, uh, in 2015, so it was COP21, CMP11, and yeah, widely seen as a momentous achievement. Uh, at the same time, of, I've said in other presentations that you know it's it's a paradox. What was achieved? There was it was a tremendous success in the context of the history of failure and the political headwinds that it faced. At the same time, it's also a tragic failure in that the goals that were set there are so inadequate and you know we are going to see the loss of coral reefs and tremendous human suffering even if they're achieved. But the alternative at the time was nothing, just ongoing acrimony and just basically business as usual and everyone basically fighting. So in that context, Paris was actually co coming from nothing, coming from the ashes of Copenhagen 2009. Paris was actually a massive achievement. So in the lead up to it, the 
so the, the context was, and this is why the history is so important to understand, so Kyoto Protocol had failed, but also the US had never been able to ratify it. And Obama faced a hostile Senate. He knew he couldn't get anything ratified by the US Senate. So one of the absolute foundations for the, the building momentum was that there would be no, nothing binding, nothing. Because under the US system, the president can negotiate. Uh, so the executive government can negotiate. Uh, if there is an agreement that Im imposes any legally binding obligations on the US, then it has to be ratified by the US Senate. But the, the uh, president can enter into essentially non-binding uh, agreements with other countries, like for, say, um, to allow, say, a US military base to go into another country. The president can have an agreement with uh, that country to allow the base to go in. So there are a lot of sort of executive level agreements that don't get ratified by the Senate and the US system and the political situation meant that it needed to be kept that way. And because the US is so important globally as you know, such a major emitter and, and uh, rich country and such a you know, core part of the global economy, it needed to be uh, included. So the global community accommodated the US's requirement that there be nothing binding. So what the approach that was taken was to ask countries to volunteer what they would do to achieve the target. Uh, in Copenhagen, um, they had yeah, set this two degree target. I mentioned that yesterday that Obama had, it was the Copenhagen Accord and reflected two degrees. And countries were asked to say what, that they, what they would do to achieve the two degree target and the intention was that they would make a, a promise and then there would be a ratchet up mechanism whereby we'd continue to review it and continue to improve it over time. But it goes from a binding top down approach with things like binding commitments that are specified to a voluntary bottom up where everyone just basically puts in what they want to. So the commitments when they were first delivered were called Intended Nationally Determined Contributions or INDCs and they're now called Nationally Determined Contributions, so the NDCs. And you can go and look at them if you want to have a look at your own country's uh, INDC. You can just go to the UNFCCC website, you can look at every country. They, uh, they had a pretty standard form. Um, we don't need to get bogged down in the details. Most countries, you know, are doing something like, you know, renewable energy programs, um, energy efficiency measures, you know, so countries would basically group together everything that they were already doing and uh, without specifying any binding targets, uh, say, you know, that like Australia specified it would reduce certain, you know, achieve certain emissions reductions, pretty minimal. Uh, but there was basically voluntary um, measures that would be taken. And on, um, in the lead up to it, I, like I was actually running the course, in tw this course in 2015, and the Paris Agreement opened when the course started. And uh, the uh, in, in the targets, this Article 2, they had bracketed one point, the 1 1.5 target. So the, the target that ultimately was set in Article 2 was holding the increase in global temperatures to well below 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. And 1.5 degrees was bracketed, which meant it still hadn't been decided. And I said to the class, I just don't think it will be there by the end. It will be cut out. There's no way that you know, countries like Australia are going to agree to it. Uh, by the end of the conference, though, it had been unbracketed and 1.5 was still there. And I was ecstatic because it meant that, hey, maybe there was a hope for coral reefs if the world was actually moving to be more ambitious. And so the 1.5 degree target was very much driven by EOSIS, so the Alliance of Small Island States saying that at two degrees their countries would be destroyed and they couldn't accept that. So 
you can see how it's phrased. You can think of two degrees as the hard target, 1.5 as the aspirational target, because the way it's phrased, it's, it's not binding. That, and, and obviously, if you uh, only achieve the two degree target, then you haven't reached the 1.5 degree target. Uh, so two degrees hard target, 1.5 is aspirational. So this, these targets, particularly the 1.5, they were a big achievement in the sense of where the global community had been just a few years before and the failure to get any consensus around you know, what, what would be. So that was positive and there was a momentum that was building it, you know, again, you know, like wind coming back into the sails of the, this whole process and it seemed like there could be progress made and, and you know, with the ratchet up mechanisms we could hope. And the defining feature of Paris, I don't need to go into the provisions of it, I could go in and look at things about the non-commitments that were made and the like, but I really only want you to understand the, the target, the two, point, the two degree and 1.5 degree, and then also that it's non-binding. So there's no formal mechanisms to penalise non-compliance or failure to meet the commitments, um, nor is there any mechanism for climate loss and damage. So this was uh, something that, so countries that are going to be impacted by climate change have pushed for an ability to be paid by the countries that have caused it. So like Tuvalu, for instance, has caused virtually no, has virtually no contribution to climate change, but they will be destroyed. So they were saying we should be able to claim compensation from the countries like the US that have caused it. And you won't be surprised to know that the US, Australia, refused to even enter into negotiations about that. They just say, no, we won't be liable. So climate loss and damage is, one, again, one of these issues that's just... There is some provisions in the, like the Warsaw um, uh, framework and you know, there is provisions about climate loss and damage, but it's all basically voluntary. There's no, there's no clear way for a country like Tuvalu to sue the US or get, say, a billion dollars from the US for the fact that its whole population is going to have to leave and go somewhere else. So someone, you know, paying them to then go and get, you know, land somewhere else. So there's no mechanism for climate loss and damage. There's no penalties for non-compliance. So in many ways it's very weak, but you have to see it in the context of how the, the bad situation that there was before. This, I think, is a really uh, in, uh, important quote from Ban Ki-moon. He says, I have been attending many difficult multilateral negotiations, but by any standard this negotiation is m most complicated, most difficult, but most important for humanity ever. So this is the man who had been two terms as UN Secretary General, the top global diplomat for a decade, saying this is the most difficult multilateral negotiation he'd ever been involved in. That gives you some idea about how complex it was. Um, this is just a comment on it. Since the Kyoto Protocol of 1997, the UNFCCC has failed to produce comprehensive legally binding agreement to reduce global emissions. Year after year, negotiators have gathered with little to show for their toil. However, global greenhouse emissions have been rising, the earth is getting warmer, and we've begun to feel the impact of frequent severe weather events. The Paris Agreement has ended the drought of multilateral action on climate change. Its meaning and impact will no doubt be debated. Uh, it is imperfect and should be strengthened with time, but don't underestimate the significance of this event for the trajectory of the multilateral system and humanity. So that's written just after the agreement was reached on the 18th of December 2015. And I agree, I think it was a really significant achievement and momentous. And further comment on it, the significance of the power agreement Paris Agreement goes well beyond climate change. It shows us that multilateralism is alive and well, and it can navigate a path through the stormiest of weathers. Climate negotiations in Paris were just one moment in time, but it should give us hope in humanity's ability to address the collective challenges that lie ahead. Obviously a very rosy, um, positive uh, take on the situation. Um, the momentum continued 
uh, to build and, and the Paris Agreement, so it was signed in the end of December, so countries signed it in December of 2015. It entered into force within a year. So by, you know, 4th of October, uh, 115 parties had ratified and the agreement entered into force. Obama also ratified it because it was non-binding, he could do that. So the US ratified it. Um, and then there was ongoing uh, COPs. So the next year there was um, uh, Marrakech in Morocco, COP22, picture of the uh, leaders. But then 2016, uh, the US uh, presidential election elected Donald Trump, who had sort of played ignorance on climate change, hadn't really said during the election what his views were, um, had said during the election there was some connectivity between human activity and global warming, and he was keeping an open mind on the Paris Agreement. And yet when, and when he got into you know, his anti-trade agreement, so one of his first acts was to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations. Uh, but by June of 2017, the US had announced its intention to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. And just uh, last month, it lodged its formal uh, documentation to withdraw. It doesn't withdraw until uh, next year, it doesn't formally happen. So if Trump loses the um, election to a Democrat, um, it could be that the US m continues, you know, withdraws its withdrawal uh, and stays in. But at the moment, the US is on basically on the, the path to withdrawing from the agreement. They go along as a, an observer, but they're not a part, well, I suppose they still technically are a party, but they're certainly uh, not supporting uh, global action. The agreements, sorry, the meetings continue to roll on. So last, well, in 2017, there was, the COP was held in Bonn in Germany. And last year was in Katowice. And this year it was to be in Chile, but because of the uh, civil unrest in Chile, it's been transferred to Madrid in Spain. And so you'll see in the news, no doubt, in coming days, it's starting on the 2nd of um, next month and running for s till the 9th. And uh, I just noted all the acronyms here. So it's COP25, so that's a conference of the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change 25. CMP, so the conference of the meeting of the parties to the Paris Agreement 15. Sorry, not the Paris Agreement, the Kyoto Protocol 15. The um, CMA, so that's the Paris Agreement, no, it's number two. And then the SBSTA 51 is a sus subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice. And S, uh, it should be SBI, not SABI, it should be SBI 51 is a subsidiary body for implementation. So these are all technical meetings that are happening uh, at the same time. So there's multiple meetings occurring in Madrid. No doubt you'll see a lot in the news. Uh, and things are still moving forward. You know, there's been, you know, last year there was a big push for looking at enforcement of the NDCs and how countries will account. And one of the big issues is whether China will allow you know, international observers to go in and verify emissions reductions. China's reluctant to do that. And yeah, so those sorts of things are the sorts of things that are being discussed at these meetings. Um, but it's certainly the wind has been taken out of the sails of progress by the US political situation. So, you know, where are we at now? You know, just in the news in the last few days, we've had the World Meteorological Organization announced that greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere reached their highest level yet last year at 407 parts per million. Um, if you go on to the Moa Loa, Moa, Mauna Loa Observatory um, website, the NOAA website, um, the 
current level of greenhouse gases there is at 408 parts per million. Uh, you know, as we talked about in relation to the UNFCCC, that goes up and down um, with seasons. Um, but yeah, so it's been higher than 408 um, early this year. Um, yeah, it's pretty terrible um, where we're at. We're seeing ongoing rises in greenhouse gases. None of these agreements have stopped the rise in greenhouse gases. Um, you know, we're in a really difficult situation. And just a few days ago, the United Nations Environment Program released its emissions gap report. It's a pretty horrible report, I think, from a communication perspective. I look through it looking for a good graph to explain it. And this is sort of the best that I could find. Uh, you might have seen it in the news. I put it in one of those tweets that I put out, if you looked at that Twitter thing. But basically, uh, what they're showing is emissions in gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents, so billions of tons of greenhouse gas emissions, and obviously that's carbon dioxide equivalent, so that's carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, um, and they're saying based on 2005 policy scenarios, we would have been above 60 gigatons. The current policy scenario going up to 2030, we're lower than that, so there has been some improvement, um, but the under the nationally determined contribution scenario it's still only slightly better and if we were to actually be achieving the two degree range or 1.5 we would need to be dramatically um, there would be need to be a dramatic reduction in emissions and that's not on the cards with current policy. The current policy, so this report is about the gap, the emissions gap, and there's this huge gap um, between what we would need to be doing to achieve stabilisation at 1.5 degrees or even 2 degrees. And each year, because the emissions are cumulative, because the... Uh, fossil carbon that we emit stays, continues to affect the atmosphere for hundreds of years. Once you emit it, you can't get it back, at least on current technologies. So every time you emit more than you, you know, what you should in a particular year, it just builds up and builds up. It means that to get within the 1.5 or 2 degree range, you've got to have dramatic reductions really quickly. So there's this huge gap between what we're currently achieving and what is required in terms of emissions reductions if we're going to stabilise at 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees. So on current projections, um, this is I think a much better visually, uh, and this just comes from a, um, a carbon uh, climate interactive scoreboard website um, that's run by some fantastic climate scientists. and. You can see there a, a simple sort of representation on business as usual by 2100 we're more looking at three or four degrees. Um, even under the NDCs we're looking at three degrees and our goal is 1.5, we're well short of that. Or oh, this is another good, um, it hasn't been updated since 2017 because the NDCs haven't really changed so it, it's not any different now. Uh, but on business as usual as a reference scenario, we'd be looking at like four degrees. If the NDCs are actually achieved, we would be looking at three degrees warming by 2100. Uh, to achieve two degrees or 1.5 degrees, we need to massively reduce what we're currently doing, but also go far better than what the NDCs are. So there's this huge gap between current actions and what we need to do to stabilize at 1.5 or two, and yeah, and I go back to my point that the sad thing is, even at 1.5 or 2, we're still going to have huge impacts. So will we leave the Great Barrier for our children? The answer is clearly no. Um, it's unlikely that we'll even achieve 2 degrees. And at 2 degrees, the reef will be completely gone. And this is that article I mentioned yesterday, but research from earlier this year saying spawning has collapsed in the Great Barrier Reef after two years of back-to-back -back warming. Basically, there's a collapse in spawning. 
So uh, it's a grim situation for climate. So if we think of where we're at now, um, despite successes, like you can say the Paris Agreement was a success compared to what had been happening previously, it's still a grim situation globally. Okay, so that's uh, the Paris Agreement. I want to, and our you know, climate change, I really just want you to be aware in terms of the climate, um, you know, the main features of the UNFCCC, the main features of the Kyoto Protocol, the main features of the Paris Agreement, and the fact that it's non-binding, the targets that have been set, and then really every, all the other details are immaterial as long as we continue to see emissions rise until we see it dramatically coming down everything else is just immaterial details you know all the accounting rules and all of that sort of stuff all we're doing is counting well uh, this the, yeah a failure a policy failure i wanted to move on to look at the um, sustainable development goals so let's look at this this is uh, so again, it occurred in 2015 and was an initiative very much um, backed by Ban Ki-moon. And so this is the uh, now an important international policy framework and builds upon, you know, in previous lectures we've looked at the Brundtland Report as establishing sustainable development as the central overarching goal for environmental regulation globally. And then in 1992 there was Agenda 21 which tried to set out a detailed roadmap for how we achieve sustainable development. The sustainable development goals are the modern iteration of sustainable development and you'll see them regularly if you go onto any international websites, even government websites, you'll often see references to the sustainable development goals and so they're an important, so they were, they were passed by a resolution of the UN General Assembly, so what does that mean in terms of their binding effect? Are they binding if it's a resolution of the General Assembly? No, they're not. It's, they're not a treaty, they're just a resolution of the UN General Assembly, so they're non-binding, but they're very persuasive and many countries are working to achieve them even though they're non-binding. So you can go and have a look at the website. There's 17 goals and 169 targets and they deal with uh, poverty, hunger, good health, quality education, gender equity, uh, clean water and sanitation, affordability and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, uh, responsible consumption and production, climate action, um, oceans and below the water, uh, life on land, so biodiversity, on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions and partnerships for the goals. So those are the 17 sort of goals and areas. You can get anything you want there, you know, in terms of your research papers, if you've got, if you want to basically focus on some social justice topic, I'm happy for you to look at, uh, use the sustainable development goals. There's, they're so broad, there's so much there, you can really, you know, use them as the springboard to any topic really I think that you want and very powerful well worth looking at um, as an example of one of the STDs I'll just look at goal 14 so goal 14 is about water just before I do that um, one of the big topics we haven't talked about in our course one of the outstanding pressures on the environment is population growth and obviously it's a very fraught topic religiously and culturally to discuss controlling population. So generally we don't. There's no international agreements on population control, generally environment conventions all just ignore the topic, but it's a major driver for impacts on the environment. There's nothing really in the sustainable development goals about population control directly. Does anyone know though the best mechanism that we've got? Because there's, there's only really, as I see it, only one real mechanism that has any chance 
politically, religiously and culturally with all the barriers to talking about population control? What's the best mechanism we have for controlling population? We've got three... Empowering women. Empowering women. Education. Education. Gender equality. Gender equality, yes. I would have described it as education for women, so it's sort of like all three. <laughs> so um, ed women's education is one of the most powerful mechanisms we have for population. I'm not even going to use the word control, but you know, in terms of um, leveling off with, you know, because essentially uh, if we can educate women, it virtually always leads to those women having less children by choice. So women's education is something that um, I would say is universally, you know, acceptable, but I, I actually, you know, if you look at countries like the Taliban in Afghanistan, then one of the ways that they oppress women is to deprive them of education and, you know, r not allow them uh, any opportunities. So even women's education isn't a universal, you know, is something that we can't say is a universally acceptable policy, but certainly it's one of the most powerful things that we can do. So, you know, like if anyone's a World Vision sponsor, you know, my criteria, for, so I've been a World Vision sponsor for a couple of decades, and I've always just said, um, I just want a young girl in, you know, South America or um, Afghanistan or something. So, you know, if you're contributing to, if we're contributing to education, particularly of um, women in those communities, that's one of the best things we can do, I think. Okay, so 17 goals, and this is an example of one of the SDGs because the interesting thing is they they merge sort of qualitative and quantitative targets, um, and that's, I find that really interesting. I'm I'm a sort of nerd for these sort of things and, and policy setting. So I wrote a, an article for a book about uh, international policy setting and talked about how these, the SDGs are such an interesting example of uh, n sort of nested goals where you have some high level broad qualitative things that are easy to explain, like no poverty or life below water. It's, you know, um, the good health and well-being, they're qualitative, broad, easy to explain, everyone can understand them. And then as you get into them, then they have levels of more complex and even quantifiable targets within those broad goals. So goal 14 is to conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas and marine resources for sustainable development. So that's a qualitative statement of a goal. But then when you look at the targets, 14.1, by 2025, so we're giving a time frame, prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds, in particular from land-based activities, including marine debris and nutrient pollution. So that's a qualitative target, but there is a time frame associated with it. Just jump down to 14.5, by 2020, conserve at least 10% of coastal marine areas, consistent with national and international law, based on the best available scientific information. Notice that that's a quantitative goal, at least 10%, and by 2025. So um, it's, a, it's a target that can be verified. You know, a country can, you know, show on a map, yes, we have set aside 12% of our maritime zones as marine protected areas or, or not. So SDGs, uh, there's a lot to them. You can go and have a look around. I just want you to be aware of them. They're an important uh, soft law uh, initiative that's, that's uh, yeah, now an important component of the global um, policy framework. Yeah, so Ban Ki-moon, um, the former UN Secretary General, very much drove these and they're, yeah, they're an important high level agenda for the UN. I just wanted to mention also, so the focus has been on climate change through this whole period, and I've said that you know all of the major treaties were negotiated. Things do continue to you know, bubble along with other treaties. So uh, in 2013, there was a new international regime um, for um, mercury called the Minamata Convention. Does anyone know um, why it's called the Minamata Convention? <laughs> 
<laughs> Other than you. <laughs> Anyone who's not from Japan. <laughs> okay, tell us why it's called the Minamata Convention. Yes, so Minamata was a city in Japan that uh, the local communities uh, start, started to suffer um, great birth defects and it was ultimately traced to pollution from factories uh, that were basically pouring waste into the ocean that had mercury and then it basically was through bioaccumulation through the food chain and then people were eating fish that were caught in the ocean and babies were born with terrible, terrible um, birth defects. It was called Minamata disease, but essentially it was birth defects caused by mercury poisoning. And uh, so um, the convention is named after uh, that city for that reason. There was a famous example I remember when I was a, I think uh, even studying as an undergraduate student here, remembering hearing a story of one of the um, chief executive officers uh, from one of these companies came, you know, to do a PR exercise and drank a cup of um, effluent coming out of the pipe to show how clean it was. And it later um, uh, um, came out that, in fact, the effluent had been switched off for that day and they were just pour pouring uh, clean water through the pipe. So, you know, just the deceptive nature of that. So, Minamata Convention dealing with mercury poisoning. I just mention it, um, obviously it's a specific, there's many other environmental treaties obviously that we haven't mentioned as we've gone along. I just wanted to say things, you know, continue to develop. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership I'd mentioned in relation to trade, so, um, and you know, trade agreements continue to bubble along. I, I didn't post about it, but there was, um, I saw yesterday our, uh, the Australian Minister responsible for trade uh, complaining about Europe, uh, so Australia's trying to negotiate a trade agreement with Europe and Europe has wanted to put in some requirements about climate change and meeting the, the Paris Agreement targets and Australia has said, that's outrageous, how dare you do that? You can't do that, it's so, you know, just so out of the box. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, there's, you know, Australia knows there's no bottom that Australia can't go beneath or swim. You know, there's no muck that we're not prepared to swim through on climate change. Um, anyway, um, I just mentioned also the Global Pact um, for the Environment, so a proposed new international agreement. Uh, 10th of May last year, the UN General Assembly resolved to initiate a process to identify, quote, possible gaps in international environmental law. Uh, with a view to strengthening their implementation and it's called the Global Pact for the Environment and it's, it's an ongoing process. Uh, there's also, I mentioned, ongoing initiatives under, to deal with fishing on the high seas, so pushes for a better, more comprehensive regime to deal with high seas fishing. Uh, so those are the, you know, there are obvious gaps and things that will continue to evolve is really the main message I wanted to say. So at this point we've, you know, covered the major environmental treaty since 1945, uh, talked about it in terms of the evolving story. So we've gone through the past, we've reached the present, and I want to just spend a bit of time thinking about the future, because that's where you, your, your careers will all occur in. So in the future, what's, you know, what do we expect to see in terms of not only climate change but other regimes. Well, in terms of other regimes, we'll see, you know, we'll continue to see them implemented. So, you know, the Conference on Biodiversity, the Convention on Biological Diversity, they'll continue to have um, meetings. You know, we're going to miss the 2020 targets. They will set new targets. Uh, you know, there's a whole range of ongoing implementation of these treaties. Um, but in relation to climate change, you know, what does the future hold for that? I'd say this, that the President Trump hasn't derailed the Paris Agreement. It's certainly hampered um, 
the global progress and taken the wind out of the sails. But really, if you look at it, the US is really in isolation on this. And uh, the rest of the world is not walking away from Paris. That was a concern when Trump announced, you know, they were going to withdraw, whether that would cause other countries like Russia or others to pull out. And even though Russia is, you know, a very laggard as well, uh, they're staying in the process and there's still the impetus from Europe particularly to push forward. To me, one of the big questions we face globally is whether China will emerge as the global leader in the wake of Trump's election. And you might laugh at that and think, oh, well, why would China do that? And there's, I'll give you two points. One was something that Obama said. Uh, he said in pushing for renewable energy and you know action on climate change, he said, the country that leads the world on renewable energy will lead the 21st century. And China, there are two twin things happening, I think, uh, and I know I'm speaking to many um, Chinese nationals, but to me the two big drivers that give hope for China taking action is, one, the terrible air pollution in uh, many cities in China. So the oppressive air pollution in Beijing and elsewhere means that there is tremendous public pressure on the Chinese government to take action. Now, uh, we know that China is not a democracy, so people don't get a vote. At the same time, uh, you know, if you are a party that's come to power through revolution, uh, you should be well attuned to, to what the people are thinking. So even though China isn't a democracy, that's not to say that the pressure of public opinion and the, you know, the huge concern that people have about health, the health impacts of air pollution, there's clearly a massive driver at a domestic political level for China to address air pollution. And one of the obvious ways to address that is through changing from coal power, fossil fuels, um, particularly in like the region around Beijing, uh, to renewables. And also moving from fossil fuel cars and transport and buses to electrification of vehicles. So combined with that, China has clearly identified renewable energy as you know, a growth sector for the future. And uh, clearly what they're trying to do is uh, position themselves into new sectors where they can develop the intellectual property and then essentially gain the uh, income from you know, the developing new technologies. So rather than, uh, obviously there's a lot of um, intellectual property that's flowed to China uh, through different means. Uh, but you know, in terms of re the renewable sector, there's opportunities there to create you know, new intellectual property uh, and try and corner the market, be the global leader in new renewable energy and earn the income from it. So they see it, there's both the domestic pressure to respond to oppressive pollution as well as the strategic opportunity to be a global leader in the sector and the global manufacturing hub for renewables. So that's where I see, you know, I don't think China is emerging as a global leader in climate change for philanthropic reasons, you know, just because it's, you know, good for humanity. It's actually good for China and strategically good for China. Any thoughts on that from, particularly from uh, Chinese nationals? Your thoughts on those two things? Yes? Yeah, great. So you're, I'll just repeat that so it's picked up by the recording. Your family has an electric car and it's been a big push in China recently and if you do you get a, a rebate from the, the government to, to buy it. Uh, so I, I heard this figure last year that uh, last year in terms of uh, electric buses uh, there was something like two or four hundred thousand um, sold in China and like 12 in the rest of the world or something like that. It was, you know, it was some ridiculously hundreds of thousands in China and virtually none in the rest of the world. Um, so it's 
seems like an obvious thing in terms of dealing with pollution that, you know, if you're a city and you just change your bus fleet from diesel to electric, uh, it's, you know, ways of dealing with those sorts of issues. Yeah. And any other thoughts on that? Anyone else? Okay, so I'm, you know, can I say helpful? Like, I think it's just this big question. You know, one of the biggest one of the biggest reasons to be hopeful about climate change is actually the possibility that actually China will will lead on this. It's not going to be the US, but you know China is pushing to be a, you know, it is a global superpower now. This is a tremendous strategic opportunity. The US is absent from the field. This is an opportunity for it to lead and hopefully partner partner with the EU. So yeah, um, this is just an article from a few years ago um, talking about for China, multiple factors came together between Copenhagen and Paris. China's growth was slowing and its leaders understood from the examples of South Korea and Japan that their economy needed to be more efficient in its use of energy and resources and that it needed to upgrade its capacity to produce advanced high value technology, preferably with China owning the patents if it was to avoid stagnation. By the time of the 13th five year plan in 2015, it was clear that China's leadership had identified low carbon technologies as the technologies of the future and since these were new technological frontiers, there was an opportunity for China to establish its dominance as an innovator as well as a manufacturer and exporter. For China, the opportunities that tackling climate change offered began to be seen as the engine of the next phase, phase of prosperity. Last year, China invested 102 billion in renewable energy and installed half of the world's new wind power. It's still highly dependent on coal, but its coal consumption has peaked and begun to decline to be replaced over time by renewable hydro and nuclear power. So that's from 2016, but you know, reflecting what I've said about, you know, there's a, they're seeing it as a strategic opportunity. I also think that Australia should see it as a strategic opportunity. You know, one of the best opportunities we've got to harness, you know, to turn the ship around for climate change is for people to see it actually as a job creator, not just a threat. So yeah, will China and the EU form the climate block? I put that as a question mark because I think it really is, you know, in terms of hope, where will it come from? It's not going to come from the US. It's not going to come from Brazil, for instance, with that crazy president that they've got wanting to cut down the Amazon. Uh, you know, there's, if you look around for beacons of hope, it's China and the EU. So the world needs China's ongoing leadership on climate. That's the reality. Okay, so what do we know about the future on climate change regulation? Um, well, the, I think that the future is going to be disaster driven. We talked about this in relation to MARPOL. I don't know if it will be this season in Australia, but we, you know, we are seeing disasters and they're clearly linked to climate change. Uh, the question is at what point will that become just unsustainable politically for like the, the coalition, our current government, to deny that when people's houses are burning down? And vast tracts of Australia are being, yeah, obliterated by um, climate change. Also, is there a role for climate litigation? I ask this as a uh, lawyer um, and multi-scalar governance. So lawyers are talking about, you know, that it's not just about the international framework. There's lots of things happening at, you know, local government level. There's a lot of litigation going on in the US. Big litigation programs to try and target and shut down coal-fired power generators run by the Sierra Club, and in Australia, we just earlier this year we had the Gloucester Resources or Rocky Hill decision I mentioned, where a judge rejected a coal mine in New South Wales based in part on climate impacts. So yeah, I'm excited about climate litigation. I hope you are too. <laughs> no, I'm only I'm half joking with that. I I just think litigation has there are opportunities. Uh, certainly the big thing I'm pushing for. Um, so I've been working up in um, Papua New Guinea and So I've been working up in Papua New Guinea and one of the things that I've been looking at for several years is um, whether we can sue um, big companies for emissions. So my focus has been, if it will open, um, this is an article that I've got coming out in 
the next edition of Australia's Environmental and Planning Law Journal, Identifying Opportunities for Climate Litigation, a transnational claim by customary landholders in, in Papua New Guinea. Let's scan. Uh, a, cust a transnational claim by customary landholders in Papua New Guinea against Australia's largest climate polluter. Uh, existing laws in many jurisdictions provide opportunities for climate litigation in the context of the extensive harm climate change is causing and will cause in the future. This article examines 10 key questions for identifying opportunities for climate litigation and applies them to a case study of the potential of potential transnational litigation by customary landholders in Papua New Guinea against the company that operates the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions in Australia, the Luyang A power station in Victoria. Remarkably, at current rates, the emissions from this single company are double PNG's entire direct annual national emissions and cumulatively equate to a century of PNG's emissions. The PNG legal system offers remarkable scope for claims against large overseas polluters. Transnational litigation such as this is a relatively new frontier for climate litigation. The real prospect of liability for transnational climate damages has enormous implications for Australia, PNG and the global, global climate regime. So yeah, the, what I'm really looking at there is can you sue an individual company? This one company in Victoria emits 20 million tonnes of CO2 a year. PNG's entire national emissions are 10 million tonnes. So if we sue in PNG, uh, there's a whole heap of links between PNG and Australia in terms of our legal systems, but we can sue in PNG for the damage done in PNG, and the main thing we have to prove is that there is a material contribution by this emitter to the harm that's being experienced in PNG, and basically looking at um, PNG customary landholders who have ownership rights over surrounding coral reefs and focusing on the damage to coral reefs and then basically the, the idea is to sue a big company uh, and basically break down the wall of damages. So as soon as a company can be held liable for their emissions, it's going to have enormous implications for all of the, um, the companies. So essentially what we're trying to do is at an international level, Australia and the US have refused to accept the, any liability for their emissions. So we can't use the international framework, but we can just use normal laws at a national level to sue transnationally if we can establish the link, so a material contribution. They don't have to be the sole cause, they just have to make a material contribution to the harm. Yes, so they, the response of the emitters might be to say, oh, we're not the only ones liable, it's, it's also all these other companies that are emitting, and that will be part of their response. But um, the law is clear that you don't need to be the sole cause of harm. If we can identify that you are emitting uh, a, a material, if you'll make a material contribution to the harm, then you can be liable. So that's the basic argument. And it goes back to this, we're basing it on, uh, so PNG inherited essentially Australia's legal system in many regards. They've got a PNG flavour to it, but there's a lot of PNG and UK common law. And we're look, basing it on Australian cases, but also going back to old U UK cases that looked at um, liability for pollution from pollution of rivers from multiple factories and where you can't identify an individual factory as the sole cause, it doesn't matter. As long as they each make a material contribution, they each can be liable. Yes? If you guys could set this precedent, like what, how far reaching do you think those implications would be for like insurance, financing, and shareholder confidence and fossil fuels? Yeah, massive. Yeah. Uh, so we're looking at suing in Australia, but then we'll also look, because the US also has provisions for enforcement of foreign money judgments. So what the key thing is we're looking at here is getting an award of damages. So once you've got an award of damages, it's possible to get it, that enforced in the foreign judgment. So we would sue in PNG and then seek to enforce it in Australia. So actually get the money through the Australian court system, but having findings from the PNG system. So um, if you're interested in that, um, on 
on my website, um, if I can spell my website, uh, there's a recording about um, identifying climate litigation opportunities and there's a, basically a recording on, on that idea if you're interested in those things. I mention that to uh, point out that there are a whole heap of things happening that don't, that the Paris Agreement and the inadequacies of it, uh, yes, that's you know, a major cause for concern and the international framework is only really trickling forward in, you know, given the, the US, the position for the US government and the, the problems that the current administration is creating. But there are other things happening and um, yeah, I want to talk in the next lecture about yeah, maintaining hope and doing what you can. Okay, I just want to wrap up. Um, oops, wrong one. That's our next. Okay, so uh, just this week uh, an article came out in Nature Climate Tipping Points, Too Risky to Bet Against, uh, written by a number of um, global uh, or international leaders in the scientific community. Um, Johan Rockström from Sweden, Will Steffen from the US, um, Hans Joachim uh, Schillenhuber, really uh, leading scientists talking about essentially the tipping points that they had thought were further away uh, then and now, you know, increasingly science is saying tipping points that we thought were a long way away are now looking to be much closer and 1.5 degrees looks much, much safer than 2 degrees. It's, it's uh, really risky to go to 2 degrees and uh, I think that that article is one that I'll set for one of the um, uh, post-grad choices for reviewing and writing about in the exam. So climate tipping points. I just mentioned it came out just a few days ago. It's been in the, mu in the news. So 28th of November it was published in Nature. So the current state of global affairs show there's no end point where success is guaranteed um, for a safe, prosperous society. You know, like there was this moment of light under Obama and, you know, the Paris Agreement at the end of 2015 and then election, you know, the following year and you, know, you get a, a, a government that just, you know, decimates the, the gr global progress. Uh, similarly, in, if you look at a country like Brazil, with the current Prime Minister, you know, just so destructive. Uh, and it, it's really difficult to see how Brazil will move forward, uh, how it can, you know, deal with the threats in the Amazon. So there's no... It's not just like we're progressing in this ever-improving society. There's steps forward and steps back. So we have to work with this reality and not some abstract utopia or theory um, where international and national policies are perfect and enduring. And yeah, what will the climate policy look in 20... What will climate policy look like in 2050? I don't know, but we should remain hopeful that uh, there will be better outcomes than currently you could logically say are going to be achieved based on current policies. So, uh, because as, you know, if we despair about it and decide to do nothing, well, that's, you know, not helping. Um, we have to work with what we've got. And I just want to play you to finish um, this amazing poem. So in the lead up to the Paris Agreement, there was a high level meeting in New York and this wonderful um, woman from, I think she was from Kiribati, might have been, might have been the Marshall Islands, um, gave this incredibly moving speech where she wrote a poem to her daughter. Our next speaker was selected from more than 500 candidates to represent the voice of civil society. From the Marshall Islands, please welcome and I'm just going to bring it forward to her poem. I would now like to share with you
daughter, Matafele Bino. Dear Matafele Bino, you are a seven-month-old sunrise of gummy smiles. You are bald as an egg and bald as the Buddha. You are thighs that are thunder, shrieks that are lightning, so excited for bananas, hugs, and our morning walks along the lagoon. Dear Montefele Bino, I want to tell you about that lagoon, that, that lazy lounging lagoon, lounging against the sunrise. Men say that one day that lagoon will devour you. They say it will gnaw at the shoreline, chew at the roots of your breadfruit trees, gulp down rows of sea walls, and crunch through your island's shattered bones. They say you, your daughter, and your granddaughter too, will wander, rootless, with only a passport to call home. Dear Matafele Bino, don't cry. Mommy promises you no one will come and devour you. No greedy whale of a company sharking through political seas. No backwater bullying of businesses with broken morals. No blindfolded bureaucracies gonna push this mother ocean over the edge. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. No one's losing their homeland. No one's becoming a climate change refugee. Or should I say, no one else. To the Carteret Islanders of Papua New Guinea and to the Taro Islanders of Fiji, I take this moment to apologize to you. We are drawing the line here because we, baby, are going to fight. Your mommy, daddy, boo-boo, Jima, your country, and your president too, we will all fight. And even though there are those hidden behind platinum titles who like to pretend that we don't exist, who like to pretend that the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, Kiribati, Maldives, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, floods of Algeria, Colombia, Pakistan, and all the hurricanes, earthquakes, and tidal waves didn't exist? Still, there are those who see us, hands reaching out, fists raising up, banners unfurling, megaphones booming, and we are canoes blocking coal ships. We are the radiance of solar villages. We are the fresh, clean soil of the farmer's past. We are teenagers blooming petitions. We are families biking, recycling, reusing, engineers building, dreaming, designing, artists painting, dancing, writing, and we are spreading the word. And there are thousands out on the streets marching hand in hand, chanting for change now. And they're marching for you, baby. They're marching for us. Because we deserve to do more than just survive. We deserve to thrive. Dear Matafele Bino, you are eyes heavy with drowsy weight. So just close those eyes and sleep in peace. Because we won't let you down. You'll see. Isn't that awesome? Don't you just wish you were a spoken word poet that you could like give a... Um, there's a local councillor that I have called Jonathan Shree and he just does these fantastic um, spoken word poems and he's just amazing. So I fully agree with her. I think that we need to take the attitude that we want to fight or we, we need to fight. That's, that being nice, expecting others to be reasonable and that government's going to take action necessary to provide, prevent climate change. It's not working. So like this quote from Winston Churchill, you know, we need to fight on the beaches. You need to take every opportunity to push for change. And I mean in this context, not taking up arms, but um, refusing to passively accept unacceptable <coughs> outcomes, refusing to just say, well, okay, that's what the government's decided, then I'll just accept that, but pushing back. Yeah, we and our kids don't get a planet B or a plan B to go to. You know, there's, not, there's no other place we're gonna go. 
There's no other place our kids are going to go than this place. So that's a wrap up for uh, this lecture. Um, we started with a stock take on the UNFCCC and CODA protocol, talked through the story of ongoing negotiations from 2009 to now. We've gone from the Copenhagen disaster to a ray of hope in the Paris Agreement in 2015, a ray of hope only because it's still inadequate, but compared to the disaster that preceded it, it was a massive step forward. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals are also a, a very important high-level policy setting. And the future, where you're going to work, it's going to be a lot of change. There's the frameworks that are there now, but we're only at a point in time. Hopefully you guys will be involved in implementing and you know, making things work better. So in summary, um, international negotiations often involve a lot of ordinary people like you and me. Uh, they, the voting blocks are really important, like the G77. The UN Sustainable Development Goals provide an important international policy commitments now, but they're soft laws. The current international commitments uh, under the Paris Agreement aren't going to avoid dangerous climate change, such as loss of coral reefs, but they're still, you know, the Paris Agreement is still important. And my view is future climate policy is going to evolve rapidly, driven by both improvements in technology, but also responses to disaster. So think about MARPOL and the disasters that drove it to jump. It's really difficult to know what is going to happen with climate policy because with those leaps, what seems to be impossible now suddenly becomes like uh, the US was resisting going into World War II uh, and the day before Pearl Harbor, um, it would have been inconceivable that, you know, after resisting, you know, being drawn into Europe, another European war, and then the day after Pearl Harbor, it was inconceivable that they wouldn't um, be, you know, wouldn't be involved. So um, what are the Pearl Harbors that we face that will change the situation um, rapidly? And things like the wildfires now, the bushfires in Australia, it's those sorts of impacts, um, but ongoing, you know, rapid changes in the environment. So we also need to main, maintain hope in this context and provide positive solutions to address it, and we need to fight. Thanks, everyone. So I hope that um, by staying at a high level, I haven't drowned you in details. Uh, I really just want you to understand the broad context of how we get to be where we are now and all the inadequacies that are there uh, and all the complexities that are there but not get lost in the details. I want to um, break now for lunch. We're on at 12 o'clock and uh, have, after lunch, I've got a short workshop on some strategies for dealing with uh, sustaining yourself in your careers because I think one of the biggest problems you, know, you face in your careers if you're working in environment and climate change sectors is burning out. It's really common to see people working in our sector burn out and so I'd like to talk to you about some strategies for avoiding that uh, and then have a course wrap up, um, where just a short um, review the lectures that we've had but not go over the detail again, um, talk about the exam and you know, after, you know, steps from here so we've got the research paper, sorry the research proposal, the research paper and the exam. Uh, and then if there's anyone who wants to give a research presentation, then, yeah, I don't think there is anyone, but um, so I'm expecting that we will be finished by, if we break now and come back at one, I'm expecting we'll be well finished by three o'clock. Um, so, and if anyone, that, that's really the, the substantive content in the course, so if anyone wants to leave, um, there's, like even when we do the course wrap up, I'm not really going to be telling you more than I've already covered in lecture one. I just want to answer, you know, provide the opportunity for anyone who wants to ask questions about anything now. Um, but the substantive content, um, that's it. Um, the workshop is some ideas that I hope will help you, but it's not going to be something obviously that's going to be tested on the exam or that you feel if you don't want to listen to that, then that's okay. Um, so.
Uh, let's take a break. Um, why don't we say quarter past one, say take an hour and a quarter for lunch? Um, and I still think we'll be finished by three. Does that sound good to you or would you prefer one o'clock? Quarter past one? Okay, well, let's take a break. Hour and a quarter for lunch.